Welcome to the abridged version of A Tale of Two Shows, Enabling Remote Theatrical Performance During the Coronavirus Pandemic, a deep dive into the development and use of a remote performance system, specifically the remote system developed for the SUNY Oneonta Theater Department's Fall 2020 shows. My name is Matt Grenier. I'm the Assistant Technical Director for the Theater Department, and I'm also the developer of the remote theatrical a performance system that we used for our shows. This is an abridged version of this presentation. Uh, this is more geared toward people who uh, have less experience in theater or maybe no experience at all. Um, and for people who are not necessarily trying to develop and implement their own remote performance system. Yeah, uh, if you are a theater person who's trying to do that, there's a four-part video series that goes into uh, a lot more depth uh, over, you know, into the whole project. So definitely check those out uh, if you're trying to develop your own system. As we get started here, let's take a look at our table of contents. So this is uh, the order we're going to go through things. We're going to talk about some background info, talk about the goals for the project, the research that went into it, how the system was implemented, how we tested it how we used it throughout the rehearsal process, uh, which includes kind of how we uh, did our design and programming of the system, as well as how we communicated and coordinated with our actors who were uh, at home, and then uh, how we used the system during our performances, and then uh, some reflections and results and some credits at the end. Uh, be aware that there are da uh, documents available for download related to this presentation. So there's a link here at, on the table of contents. Um, also, this uh, the, the downloadable PDF that goes with this presentation uh, does have navigation built into it. So you can very easily uh, click on the links throughout the uh, presentation and jump around. So I'm going to click on go to the last slide here. Um, and you'll also notice that on a regular slide, there is a navigation across the top. So you can very easily navigate from any given slide. And it will show you which section of the presentation that you are currently in. Uh, my contact information is here, as well as some additional resources and more information about the theater department. So let's jump to the beginning and get started. So we're going to go through our background first. For those that aren't familiar, here's some information about the theater department at SUNY Oneonta. We're in upstate New York, a relatively small college, small liberal arts theater program. You can check out some details here if you're not familiar with us. So uh, going into the fall 2020 semester, our college was planning to open for residents with some in-person instruction. And the theater department uh, was planning to pursue two shows initially, Medea and Noises Off. Uh, with the pandemic, we had to change uh, gears a little bit. Um, and what we chose to do was to still uh, proceed with our production of Medea following state health policies and the college's reopening plan. We were still going to produce that as an in-person class without an audience. So we would just record and release it on video. Uh, mask wear and distancing would be designed into the production. So kind of traditional, but recorded for the camera, no live audience. Noise is off. It was not possible to proceed with that project, so we scrapped that for a live remote production of the children's story, My Father's Dragon. Um, remote meaning the actors would audition, rehearse, and perform from home using video conferencing technology. Here's uh, a little bit of info about Medea if you're not familiar. Uh, Medea is a, a Greek tragedy that uh, focuses on the plight of Medea, who follows her new husband, Jason, to his home country, where she's betrayed by him uh, and her new home, and she's you know, treated as an intruder and a danger to society. If you haven't watched our video yet, you can click on the YouTube link up here and check out our show. This is just a little look at where we were at in the production process for Medea. So uh, we had our uh, costume designer, Bethany Marks, was working on renderings for the costumes that would be made for the show. Uh, the the basis for the costumes was sort of the Star Wars universe is, uh, is what, what some of the designs were based off of. Uh, and then our scenery designer, John Bagby, was working on uh, a design for the physical scenery that we would build for the show, which included... Um, considerations for distancing and kind of keeping actors spread out from each other as part of the show. 
for uh, our second show, My Father's Dragon, is a children's story about a, a character named Elmer Elevator, who travels to an island to rescue a dragon that is imprisoned by the uh, the animals of the island. So there's all sorts of uh, fun adventures that Elmer goes on in order to try to rescue the dragon. If you haven't uh, watched our show, again, you can click on the YouTube link up here and watch our show uh, before proceeding with this presentation if you haven't checked it out yet. My Father's Dragon, uh, the preparations we had done uh, for that were largely focused on the work that our uh, director, John McCaslin Doyle, did in the script. So he originally adapted the children's story for a traveling um, children's theater uh, group and then essentially did a, another round of adaptation of the script for uh, the remote performance context, so for performance over Zoom. And his script included um, sort of uh, a plan for how the characters would be laid out on screen inside of a video conferencing environment and how um, that layout would change from scene to scene, who, uh, which characters would be on screen where, and um, how, um, how they would sort of change characters from, from scene to scene. Um, a few important things about this one. One, you'll notice it says uh, uh, there's singing mentioned here. So this script actually did include some singing um, and a fair amount of kind of synchronous uh, lines as well. Um, and then this show was also to be performed live. So um, it, was, it was an objective of this show that we would perform it live to try to keep the nature of the show as close to traditional theater as possible. So the actors would, you know, would know that there was a live audience on the other side of the camera um, watching watching their performance. So that's where we were at with our preparations for My Father's Dragon. Um, as reported internationally, uh, we had a coronavirus outbreak at the start of the fall 2020 semester, which caused the campus to be shut down and students to be sent home. Um, I'm not going to comment on the particulars of that or the, or the shutdown. You know, it was obviously very stressful and demoralizing experience here and we don't really have time to dwell on it anyway. Um, the important question is how did this change our plans for the shows that we were doing? For uh, My Father's Dragon, I would say we were generally prepared for the change because we were already planning for it to be a remote show. Medea, we had completed in-person auditions and rehearsals were just about to start. Um, rather than cancel that show, um, the director and the cast chose to move the show to a remote format as well. So it would still be recorded, edited together, and then released on video. Um, it would just all be done remotely now instead of on our stage standing you know, in front of a, a physical scenery. So there's so many things to consider um, when developing a remote performance system. Um, and this is just a little sampling of all the things that we were thinking about. So like suitability of the show to the remote format, given the resources available, is it a show that, that really works in the format? Medea was pretty adaptable because most of the time there are only two to maybe four characters on screen. They don't move around a lot. They tend to stay on screen for a long period of time. So Medea was you know, pretty adaptable to the remote format. Um, you know, if we had been planning to do some kind of big, complicated musical production or something, that would be much harder to move to the remote format. Um, a consideration, you know, how many actors are in the show? How many actors need to be on screen together? Um, what kind of requirements there do there need to be for actor participation? You know, when are those requirements communicated? Ideally, they'd be communicated at auditions, which we did for My Father's Dragon, but Medea was not supposed to be remote. So we hadn't really um, established an expectation with those actors before they auditioned that they might have to perform remotely. Um, also, what kind of performance space? What kind of access to technology? Coordinating with actors at home is a huge thing. Communicating with them, providing resources to them, you know, technical support. You know, how do you get measurements from actors at home in order to make costumes? How do you do any kind of test fitting of costume pieces? What kind of opportunities are there for non-actors? You know, there's a whole technical side of things. You know, we have a stage manager, you have technicians, operators, designers. What role do they have to play in remote performance? 
also the development and deployment schedule of the system. If you're developing a remote performance system, you know, what on what schedule and how does that play into the rehearsal process? Um, how do you respond to technical difficulties, especially with live performance? You know, are you doing a show live and how does that um, inform how we respond to technical problems? Uh, captioning and accessibility is a big one and also more challenging for live performance depending on uh, how you choose to do it. Uh, potential for low latency synchronous speech or singing is a consideration. Uh, and even potential for you know the implementation of audience participation in some way, depending on you know, whether you're doing a live show or not, that's something to consider. So with all of these different considerations in mind, we need to go ahead and establish some goals for the, the project and the remote performance system. So the first goal um, is a pretty obvious one. We need to bring our actors together. So uh, you know we need to fundamentally enable the actors to rehearse and perform together in as close to real time as possible. Of course, we're going to be dealing with technology delays, but you know at the very least, it needs to be as close to real time as possible. And we need to utilize existing technology. We're not going to re you know reinvent the wheel here. We need to use existing technology. Another goal, we need to broadcast to an audience. The audience, you know, there has to be an audience that observes the performance at some point, whether that is a recording that we've made and edited or it's something that, you know, we're choosing to stream live over the internet, we need to be able to broadcast or distribute. We need to be able to control what is on screen. So controlling what the audience sees and hears is fundamental to the magic of, you know, theater in general. And normally we're doing that by changing things on stage, you know, moving curtains, scenery, changing the lighting, all that sort of thing. And now the only way we can do that is to kind of change what uh, uh, the audience is seeing and hearing on their screens at home. So we need to be able to control what is on the screen. Another goal is to try to keep the actor interaction simple. And this is this is a big one because remote performance is pretty complicated for actors. Uh, you know, they have many, many more things to worry about than normal. You know, an actor at home has to be their own lighting person, uh, their own sound technician. They have to, you know, set up their own scenery, operate their camera, their, their own makeup artist, hairdresser, costume dresser, props handler, uh, IT person. They're doing a million things that we would never really expect an actor to do in person. We'd have all kinds of crew people that would be, you know, right there with them in the wings, helping them with all of these things. So anything we can do to make their interaction with our, our remote performance system easier is a good idea. And one of the big ones is to just try to use a simple video conferencing tool, something like Zoom, something that requires minimal special setup on their device. It should be something easy for them to use. And ideally, if we can, we want to keep the actors from having to manipulate their own device settings while they're performing. So if they don't have to turn their camera on and off, if they don't have to mute and unmute their, their microphone, if they don't have to change their backgrounds, their digital backgrounds or any of that, it's going to be just you know, fewer things that they have to worry about while they're trying to perform, worrying about everything else they do have to worry about. Another goal, add other production elements to the show. So we want to be able to introduce graphics, video clips, music, sounds, credits, uh, any kind of other you know, production element. Um, and that's going to provide opportunities for designers you know, to contribute creatively so that we can manipulate the background, you know, add different elements, you know, make things kind of more creative and, and dynamic. So we need to be able to add other production elements to the show. We need to enable remote control, ideally. So that's part of providing opportunities for non-actors. That includes allowing technicians to help operate the show when they're not allowed to be in our broadcast studio physically. And that was the case. We, even though we had students that were still five minutes away from campus, they were not permitted to be physically on campus in our studio. So we had to you know, ideally provide a way to enable them to uh, control cues and control the system remotely from home. 
and another goal, adapt rapidly to technical issues. So, you know, that's fundamentally what we do in theater, you know, in live, you know, traditional live performance. We we make preparations so that when things go wrong, the show can continue, con- you know, continue forward. Um, so we need to make sure that whatever system we set up, um, it's going to be as you know, possible to respond rapidly to problems. So again, using a simple video conferencing tool. So if there's a device problem, a computer issue, an actor could switch to another device easily. Um, if we can prevent the screen from changing if an internet connection is interrupted, you know, in Zoom when and when somebody drops out of the meeting, often the screen layout rearranges. All of a sudden, the grid layout changes, and that that can be a significant problem. You know, we want to be able to cut off video or audio quickly if there's a problem. Uh, enable alternates like understudies or somebody you know subbing in to read from a script. We want to provide uh, a, an ability for them to do that quickly if there's a connection problem and an actor drops out of a live performance. And maybe even have recordings ready to go from final rehearsals in case there's a major problem. You could switch over to a recording as well. So um, the last major goal is, of course, this whole thing needs to be attainable and affordable. Um, you know, obviously, you know, lots of organizations are, are hurting and our college has certainly instituted spending controls that were even further tightened when, uh, when our shutdown happened at the start of the semester. So all this needs to be done using as many existing resources as possible, leaning on, you know, as much expertise um, that is available uh, on our campus as possible. So that's a, that's a big one. So that's, uh, those were the goals for the remote performance system that we wanted to develop. Now we're gonna get into the research that we did and that research started um, by you know, defining terms. So a big one here is uh, you know, what do we mean by remote performance and by virtual, by virtual performance? So um, the, the thing to keep in mind here is that um, a, a virtual performance is not necessarily a remote performance. So what we were originally going to do with Medea, just having the actors performing together on stage, you know, recording it and then, you know, sending the video out, we, you know, you could say that was a virtual performance. Um, you know, maybe we could have even live streamed it while the actors were performing on stage. So that would be a virtual performance. Um, what we were doing is a remote performance where the actors are are not physically in the same place. So a remote performance is always a virtual performance, but a virtual performance is not necessarily remote because a virtual performance can be done with people uh, physically in the same space as one another. Remote, uh, the actors and, and everybody are not in the same place as one another. We're going to skip through the rest of this terminology here. This is just all the the research that went into you know trying to you know sort all this out about what's video conferencing and hosts and guests and and uh, what you know waiting rooms and breakout rooms and you know meetings and all this all this stuff to navigate. You know webinars uh, is a whole other aspect of uh, of uh, sort of video conferencing. Um, uh, an important one is um, the difference between seats and cameras on screen. You know, some video video calling platforms will say, oh, you can have uh, 100 people in a call. Oh, but you can only have 25 cameras on the screen at one time. So, you know, a lot of uh, kind of caveats and things to, uh, to uh, explore and learn about. Uh, broadcast video software, we'll get into that a little more later. Um, you know, one thing we looked at is, you know, what kind of, are there any kind of turnkey options out there that we could just hire or, or use to do this sort of thing? Um, and it's, it's pretty amazing because the, the options in this area have been changing dramatically in the last three to six months. You know, there's all kinds of online uh, marketing and ticketing platforms that are offering live streaming support. There's new businesses and uh, freelancers that are, you know, offering services to fill this niche of supporting remote theater performance. But some of these have only come about in the last few months. Um, and, and they can be, you know, they can be expensive depending on, you know, the, the level of, of support you're looking for. But there are some out there. Um, yeah, we, we looked at, you know, the difference between regular video conferencing and webinars, because webinars have kind of a structure that is sort of um, geared toward performance. You know, the, 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 the 
the idea that you have sort of a host and presenters and then you know participants that are your audience a webinar could maybe be an interesting way to to do a remote performance and there are a lot of people using webinar uh, platforms um, then we started so we started looking at the ways that we could um, utilize standard video conferencing, which tends to be uh, less expensive and, and more attainable than, say, a webinar solution. Um, and some video platforms like Zoom will let you live stream uh, or uh, record, you know, to your computer right from the video conferencing application. And a lot, you know, I think we're pretty familiar with that at this point, you know, with all of the virtual meetings that we've all been doing in the, the time of the, the pandemic. Um, so you could just use a regular video conferencing call and, and do your performance there and then stream it out or record it. Um, there are different you know, advantages and disadvantages to doing that. Um, another thing that we could do is to get a broadcast software involved because a lot of video conferencing programs do not allow you to directly live stream out from the uh, from the the program. So what you can do is use a separate piece of software called a, a piece of a broadcast software that is able to capture your um, video call and then live stream it out or record it. So it's a way to sort of make any video conferencing solution like Zoom, WebEx, Google Meet, whatever it is, you can capture the call and get it out to an audience. Again, advantages and disadvantages. This is a look at one of the disadvantages related to that. I'm not going to I'm not going to dwell on this, but uh, you can take a look at it uh, a little closer if you're interested. Um, issues with trying to capture the screen of your computer. Um, another way to do this is uh, um, where you get more control out of the result is if you can actually capture the individual uh, callers from your video call. So um, whether uh, Skype and Teams uh, specifically have a method by which they will output the video from your individual callers. So you can bring that into a separate computer and then now edit and mix all of the video together from those separate callers. And that uh, uses a, a free a royalty-free uh, standard called NDI, which is basically video and audio transmitted over a computer network. So we're using a local area network um, inside of a, a studio to transmit video and audio between devices. So that's what's happening uh, in the diagram we were just looking at. Skype is sending each video call to a computer uh, over a computer network. Again, advantages and disadvantages to this. Um, uh, a way to sort of get maximum control is to actually separate our callers into separate video conferencing calls. So in this diagram, we're no longer, uh, we no longer have each of our participants in the same uh, say Zoom meeting. Now they are each in their own Zoom meeting and that gives us the maximum amount of control over both their video and their audio. So this is another way the system can be set up. Uh, again, there's some, some great advantages to this and some disadvantages. Um, like this is a little bit more of a complicated setup and it does use a lot of network data in order to uh, transmit all this information. We took a, a look at, you know, all the different uh, video conferencing options that are out there, um, the different broadcast software options. You know, if we want to take video from our actors and then do live editing of it, uh, what kind of software can we use to do that that is, you know, affordable and, and will achieve everything that we want to achieve? Uh, you know, looking at what kind of live streaming options are out there. These are kind of the five big ones. Um, we ultimately ended up using YouTube um, to do our live streaming. Uh, what about live captioning? If you're doing a live show, you know, to make it accessible, you really should be offering live captions. And there's all kinds of, uh, you know, complicated things that go into, you know, implementing captioning. There's some more research available here if you want to download in PDF. Um, you can see more more research that we did about that. And then, you know, the last part of research is is just weighing all of these different things, all these different limitations. You know, there's this um, 
popular uh, Venn diagram uh, that we refer to in theater a lot, where you can you can choose between you have to choose two out of the three: good, fast, and cheap. You can only choose two. You can't do all three. Um, and trying to navigate all these limitations feels like this Venn diagram with maybe like 10 other circles in it. There's just so many different things to try to balance in deciding what platform you should use, what software. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's really a, a lot to figure out. Um, we proceeded from this research um, sort of under the assumption that we'd probably be able to work with our campus IT to implement uh, sort of uh, a, a system a little more on the complicated side in order to meet all of the goals that we wanted to. So our research kind of ended with diagramming uh, a system out that um, we thought would, would go ahead and, and do the job for us. That brings us into the implementation phase of putting our system together. Um, this is a simplified diagram of the specific solution that we uh, that we came up with, um, where we're we're seeing now um, all of our each one of our actors are inside of their own Zoom breakout room on their own separate computer. So there, we have a laptop here with an actor in a Zoom breakout room, and then we're taking video and audio from them to our studio mixing computer and then sending, you know, doing all of our editing, sending it out to be recorded, to be live streamed. And we're also sending it back through to the actors. That way they can communicate with each other. And they're also able to see their own um, video in the show. So they can see, um, basically it provides them context for their performance. They can see how they are, you know, participating in the show. Um, so this whole implementation part of the presentation goes through all of this, this, the uh, parts of this system one by one, and we're going to kind of skip through them really quick. Um, the big one is you need a network switch to transmit all of your, uh, your network data and uh, networking te and telecom on campus uh, very fortunately provided us a network switch that we could set up in our studio so we could transmit all of our uh, data around between our computers. Um, fortunately, we already had a computer that could uh, run the software uh, and do all of the mixing and editing for us. Um, we decided to use a broadcast software called vMix to do all of our live video editing. So this is just a little look of what, what vMix looks like. Um, and there, you know, these are some of the reasons why we chose that software. This is what our, uh, our computer setup looked like initially. So we're seeing our, our video editing software right on the middle display here. And then up top, we're seeing all of our uh, input video coming from our different actors. We've got audio settings over on the left. We've got the script for the show over on the right. We're monitoring our network usage. How much data are we sending on the network? Um, so that's what our, our main computer uh, setup looked like. Uh, we needed to get a Zoom license. Fortunately, we were able to get a Zoom license from the college to use for our shows um, so that we could uh, set up all of our uh, studio computers in Zoom and assign them to breakout rooms. Uh, our interface computers that we use to interface with each of our uh, uh, actors, those were provided by uh, Mark English in, in uh, technology services. So we just used you know, basic um, fairly basic laptops for our interface with our actors. This is showing the laptop set up in our studio. So there's one laptop to receive video uh, from each one of our actors. Uh, and, you know, it's a lot of computers to have to log into and, uh, you know, sort of launch software every, every time you use them. So we had a lot of like shortcuts um, that we used and, and um, you know, things set up so that these would uh, launch software automatically for us to try to speed up how long it took us to turn all these computers on every day. Um, then we needed to get our uh, our video and audio from the the interface laptops into our mixing system, um, and we used some different applications to do that. Um, it's basically a screen capture tool that captures audio and video and then makes it available on the network. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, we also need to return video and audio back to the actors, which is again a, a very simple free software tool that just takes video and audio available on the network and then sends it into Zoom. So essentially what we're doing is we're telling Zoom not to use the built-in microphone and web camera of the computer. We're telling Zoom, I want you to use this virtual audio and video source that is that is coming from my local network. It's coming from a different computer. I want you to use that in place of the microphone and the camera. And that's what allowed the actor to see the, um, the, the product from the editing software, as well as hear um, the audio from the other actors. Um, then we, you know, we uh, we needed to add on uh, captioning and our live streaming to our system. So that's illustrated in the diagram here. Um, then we have our actors and the technology they have at home. Um, so these are some of the goals that we had for our actors, you know, internet and devices at home. Um, that's kind of a whole other, you know, other thing of, you know, do actors have devices that are going to allow them to interact with this whole system? successfully or not. Uh, we wanted to, you know, enable our remote technicians to operate the system. So uh, we need to figure out a way to integrate them with this system as well. So that's illustrated here. And then um, we have, you know, other people involved in the show, like our director and our designers, our assistant stage manager that all need to be part of this process as well. So we can just add another interface computer to the system for, for those people to participate um, in, the, in the show as well. Now we're getting into the testing phase of the system. We're going to go through this pretty fast. So one of the first things we tested was, of course, how well can you speak to each other in the system? Um, are there any echo problems going on? What kind of delays? Um, how easily can we sp speak together or not? Um, how fast can we deliver lines? You know, can we can we read lines from a script rather quickly with without big pauses in between? And uh, you know, we basically discovered what we would expect that there are, there are certainly technology delays um, inherent in the system. Um, it's not really possible to reliably speak, you know, in sync with one another. Um, and it, it's it's tough to keep the gaps between speech really small. Um, you almost have to talk on top of each other to make sure that the gaps between different um, actors' lines are not too big so that the pacing of the show feels natural. Other things we did was like stress all the computers out, try to uh, try to run a lot of a uh, lot of uh, you know video and audio through them to uh, you know to give them a, a stress test essentially. Here's a little a little video clip. So this is just a little video of an early YouTube test. We're running a YouTube video on every single laptop and then we're capturing it on the master computer. So that just kind of shows you how the, you know, the thing that is playing on the screen of each laptop is being captured and brought into the broadcast software. Um, here's a little bit from our first rehearsal with Medea. So our testing, um, of course, involved, you know, bringing the actors in uh, as part of their rehearsal process. So here's a little bit from our first rehearsal with Medea. The greatest pledge of all. This house. We're sunk if new troubles walk. Do you so see what I suffer despite my Maya Or a decent one. Our daughter, where your heart in which I skill and planning and sailed from your father's home with a maddened heart. So just a little look, you can see how we were doing some basic layouts early in the rehearsal process, bringing the actors in, getting them acclimated to the system, see how it was going to work. Um, we're going to skip over discussions of video mirroring. Here we had to figure out some things with mirroring. We had some screen capture problems. We had bandwidth problems. We, we really didn't have enough... Uh, capability to send data in our master or our uh, mixing computer so we had to do an upgrade to that computer to make sure we could transmit all the data that we needed to um, here's a look at our bandwidth usage how much data we're sending on our on our network while we're doing uh, rehearsals and shows um, 
some other issues that we had, the you know, little issues we had with Zoom along the way. Here's a first rehearsal with our other show, My Father's Dragon. So again, you know, we were doing some basic layouts of the actors in an early rehearsal here, and we'll play some uh, clips of this. Bye. Oh, give me bazooka! Swash! Ash! I'm to go where you go! Megan? No! Oh, hurry, Ethan. hurry! <laughs> you have to ride on my back as I fly! So that's just a little look of what was going on in our first, you know, first rehearsal. Uh, with my father's dragon in the system of course we were you know uh, starting to encounter some you know some issues along the way like um, this one you can see right here this is a an actor's video that has been shrunk by zoom because it's not able to send enough data uh, over the over the internet so it actually shrinks their video uh, because it doesn't have enough data available um, we d we were going to use green screens in our show to do virtual backgrounds behind our actors. So we also um, did some testing of green screen use to see how um, that would function. So here I am doing um, some green screen replacement testing. So I'm I've got a, a green screen up behind me and I'm applying a virtual background to it. And then we played around with sort of the lighting conditions and uh, the different settings and things to see how that background replacement would work. Because the actors were gonna be doing a lot of dynamic things, moving close to the camera, moving further away from the camera, um, you know, moving around a lot. And we wanted to see how that green screen replacement was going to function. And also, you know, what do what do objects that have green in them look like when um, they are when they are on screen in front of a green screen? So you can see our leaves there; we're getting some holes and transparency in them. So that was a test of our of our uh, green screen. Uh, then uh, remote cue calling and operation. We had to test out the way in which our our stage manager and our operator were going to um, execute cues, um, re you know, remotely from home. So, a stage manager's main job during a show is to command when things happen, and the operators and technicians need to respond to those commands by, you know, making changes in the lighting and video and everything. And they do that by sending, you know, with very specific commands by saying "stand by this." Uh, the operator will say standing by whatever that is. The stage manager will say, you know, do this, go. Um, so very clear commands need to be sent, um, you know, clearly transmitted. Um, basically, the issue we ran into was the <laughs> the stage manager and the operators had issues um, being able to hear the actors and one another at the same time because Zoom doesn't like to let two different people speak at the same time. So ultimately what we had to do was use a different solution for the stage manager and the operator to speak to one another. So we actually used Facebook Messenger. Um, we used an audio call in Facebook Messenger so that the, they could speak to one another um, in Messenger but listen to the actors in Zoom. So that's what this uh, looked like in practice. On the left here we have a stage manager. She's wearing a big pair of headphones uh, that's connected to Zoom and she's listening to the actors with that pair of headphones. Her operator over on the right here is also listening to the actors in Zoom on a big pair of headphones. Then both of them also have an earbud with a microphone which is connected to their uh, smartphones uh, which has a messenger call going. So they have messenger on their phones and Zoom on their computers. So they're listening to the actors in Zoom, talking to each other with Facebook Messenger. And then our operator on the right here, you can see she has a computer display where she's seeing the broadcast software in our studio. So we are sharing the screen of our broadcast software so that she can see it and then she can request control of the screen and she can actually operate the software that's in our broadcast studio from home. So the stage manager can give her instructions. She can say, stand by, cue whatever. The operator can reply, standing by, and then the operator can push the button on the software and cause things to change. 
this is a final look at how our system was set up. Uh, you can download this, uh, this diagram here if you want to take a closer look at it. So that was our testing phase. Now we're into our use phase. How do we use this system throughout the process? And there's there's so many phases in this process from early rehearsals to kind of trying to keep the actors, you know, acclimatized to the, the system as we go, which was very challenging for us because we had two different shows that we were trying to rehearse at the same time. We only had one remote performance system that we were trying to develop and implement at the same time. Uh, you know, there's a design and programming phase where you need, we have to develop a creative plan uh, that we can implement, uh, in, you know, in our broadcast software. And we have to do that without the actors. Like we, you know, we can't always have the actors there, um, you know, outside of rehearsal, we need to be able to prepare our system. Then we go into a technical rehearsal po process where all the technical elements of the show are brought together with the actors to form the show. And that begins with a very slow cue to cue rehearsal where the show is stepped through one change at a time uh, to make adjustments and essentially form the finished production. Then we of course have dress rehearsal where we rehearse as if the audience were watching and then we have our performances. We had a lot of scheduling challenges throughout this project. You know, all the normal complexities of, of planning a show, plus all the pandemic uncertainty, pressure to ship things to actors at home, um, you know, all of the, the complexity of developing a broadcast system and trying to use it for two different shows at the same time. So um, this is just a little look at our, our calendar. Design considerations. Um, you know, there's a lot of things to think about in how we how we go about um, you know doing creative design for this format. You know, because we have to, it's it's a huge challenge to adapt you know traditional modes of theater design to a digital realm that we don't normally work in. So there's expertise in this in this format that's required that we maybe don't lean on as much in you know traditional theater performance. We're not building anything physical. You know, like there's no physical scenery anymore. Now the scenery is all created by photo and video editing, graphics, animation, all that sort of thing. Uh, storyboarding is a big part of this process. So, you know, going through the script and deciding scene by scene, how are we going to lay out the screen? Where are the actors going to be? What kind of background are we going to use? How are we going to transition from one scene to the other? Um, that all has to be, you know, planned out so that you can set up the broadcast software to create this. Um, so this is just a little look at some of the, the storyboarding that we did for Medea on the left and My Father's Dragon on the right. Uh, establishing framing is a big thing. You know, how should we have the actors framed in their video? You know, based on, you know, there's all sorts of different questions that play into, into this. You know, for us, Medea, we, we left very little space above the top of the head of the actor because they didn't have any costume pieces they had to wear on their head. Um, and we wanted to see, you know, a little more of the costume, you know, the, the costume they're, they're wearing on their upper body. Um, and they don't move around too much. Uh, My Father's Dragon, they were wearing quite a lot of different costume pieces on top of their heads. So we needed to have more space in the video for that. And they were wearing a fairly simple uh, costume uh, in most cases on their upper body. So we didn't need to worry about seeing as much of that upper body costume. Coordinating with actors at home is a huge, huge challenge. Um, and we started the process off with a questionnaire. We we essentially asked all of our actors about the technology that they had at home. We did some direct calling to, to communicate with them a little further about that. Um, you know, we, we had to provision equipment for our actors at home. So, you know, we had to go through and decide what should we provide to actors at home? What can we provide? Um, here's kind of a list of the things we sent them. Big ones were, you know, a green screen so they could put a background up behind themselves when they're on camera. We sent them an ethernet cable so that they could plug directly into their, their internet router to try to get um, you know, the best internet connection possible. We sent them uh, an, ext you know, like a, an LED uh, light so they, you know, they would have a light that they could set up and, and you know, we'd be able to see their face better. And we sent them an external microphone so that um, you know, we'd have more consistent sound from everyone as well. 
Uh, we also uh, sent all of the actors uh, a link to a, a training video that we put together. So um, the idea behind this was to basically um, help make sure the actors you know, knew what was going to be expected of them when they received all their equipment. So it was to sort of communicate to them what they were going to be receiving from us and what we were um, asking them to do with it. Um, and that that we sent to them about a month before we started our tech rehearsal. So they had time to to watch that and know what they were going to be receiving. And then when we did ship everything out, we sent them some instructional handouts with all of their equipment to kind of help them, uh, you know, get their equipment set up when they took it out of the box. Then uh, the last thing before we went into our actual technical um, uh, rehearsals is we did pre-tech consultations. So these were video meetings where we brought each actor uh, into the remote performance system and then we you know, went, did a bunch of checks with them to see how, how well did they do setting up their home setup, uh, what do they still need help with, um, and basically go through and you know tweak their lighting and their their green screen setup and solve any problems that come up. Like in this case, you know, uh, in in this um, consult here, you know, the video is very washed out and stuff, so we had to deal with that problem. Um, so it's just a kind of a last minute, you know, before we get to that final rehearsal, uh, technical rehearsal period, where we can make sure all the actors are ready. And then in some cases, we were able to visit actors at home. Um, some actors were still local in town or uh, had special permission to be living on campus. So in some cases, we were able to provide them some support at home to help them with their lighting and their green screen setup and, and help diagnose problems uh, at home as well. Fairly, fairly limited that we did any of that, but in a few cases, it was necessary. Uh, this is just a little look at uh, what, what what our script for My Father's Dragon looks like. You know, we have to manage, um, you know, several different parties uh, needing to refer to the script and stay up to date with one another. So we had our scripts available, um, you know, online to collaborate with one another. Um, and then we're getting into programming of the broadcast software. So. Um, that this is the process of taking those storyboards and the script and uh, any uh, cue lists that that have been put together by the designers and all of the different elements of the show, like photos, backgrounds, graphics, all that has to come together and be programmed into the broadcast software so that we can run the show. And in order to do that, we do need to have a stand-in for the actors when we're trying to do our programming. It's just not practical to program the software with all of the actors there because it takes a long time uh, and it would be a, a waste of their time for them to be sitting there all the time. So what we did is we took a screenshot from each of our consults and we put that as the back, the desktop background of each of our laptops um, so then when the, the captured video is brought over to our broadcast software, we just get that stand-in of the actor in the broadcast software, which allows us to do our basic programming without having live video from our actors. This is a look at a few things that go into programming. We're not going to look at this in, in much detail, but, um, you know, one thing is like layering of elements on screen. You know, you know, different elements can be in front of or behind one another. So that's something we had to look at and decide on for each each layout of the screen. Um, we could do things like modification of the, you know, the color from scene to scene. So we could, um, you know, kind of change the color tone. Like in this scene, it's nighttime and the actors are sort of have a blue tint on them. You know, in this scene, it's a little more of a, like a cool tint, you know, uh, neutral or, or cool tint. So we could change our color um, from scene to scene. We could also even try to adjust the color of each individual actor's video to try to make the you know, sort of the color balance look a little more um, similar. So they all kind of, you know, looked like they were in the same place because they all had sort of the same white balance on their video. Uh, cropping is something that we could do um, in the broadcast software where you can, you can, uh, you know, cut a video down to, to uh, you know, to, to crop it in uh, into a smaller space. And one fun thing we did um, with My Father's Dragon, I'm gonna play you a little video clip, is we actually cropped the actor's video in order to, to allow them to do the crocodile scene. 
Um, so the idea behind this was so that the actors didn't have to, um, they didn't have to crouch down in order to kind of reposition themselves in their video frame. We just cropped the video up to about where their nose was and the actors could remain sitting straight upright even though we could not see anything on them from their nose down. So that's just a little example of how you can use um, you know, something like cropping to do creative things. Um, we, then we did a lot of uh, what's called color keying and luma keying where you can sample a color from an image and, and have the software remove it, which is of course how we go through and take out the actor's background. We tell the software, get rid of this green screen, and that allows us to composite the actors into a scene. But we can do the same thing for other elements of the show, like the dragon here. We tell the software, get rid of this green part, and then we can add it into a scene like this. Uh, Luma and Alpha Mass are another thing that we use to sort of put nice soft edges um, and sort of, and and do interesting crops and things like with the dragon here to put the actress's face in the face of the dragon and put a little scale texture over it. Um, that was done with a mask that's shown here. We did a lot of uh, automation things in the software as well, basically using little little scripts or programs and shortcuts and triggers and things in order to have the software do automatic things for us um, depending on what we were trying to do you know uh, from moment to moment in the show the more you can automate especially in a live show the better because it's just fewer things that you need to remember to do so there's this is a closer look at some of that stuff um, we developed a, a way to put messages on screen to the actors. So if there was a problem going on and we needed to put a message on screen to tell them about it, we could do that. Uh, we took advantage of a feature where um, the software actually mutes or unmutes um, an actor depending on whether they are on screen or not. So this is super handy for My Father's Dragon. Um, here you see four actors on screen and the software has automatically turned their audio on when they appear on screen. So that keeps us from having to manage all of the actor microphones and the actors don't have to do it either. So they just leave their audio unmuted in Zoom and the software will automatically mute and unmute them depending on whether they're on screen or not. And we can of course override that if they need to speak while they're not seen by the audience. Uh, so uh, this is a little bit more uh, programming we did to do some automated actions. And one of those automated actions was this little somersault sequence in My Father's Dragon. I'll show you quick. Uh, father finished cutting the rope and the dragon tried to somersault. <laughs> so that was just a little fun uh, sequence we did in My Father's Dragon using this, uh, this code that is written, uh, written here technical rehearsal. So tech rehearsal is that process of going through um, the, the show and putting all those technical elements together. And a big part of that is um, stopping and starting uh, constantly. So I'm going to show you a few video clips here, uh, just a couple video clips so you can get a sense of what that process is actually like. Oh. She will not escape from ruin. Go. You reckless, poorly wed son-in-law. Stand by Merge E6. Ignorant that you bring destruction upon your children's lives. In your Merge E6. Standing. Unhappy man, how far you've strayed from your destiny. Go. Next Stand by Merge F1. Old mother of sons who will murder children for the... I, I, can we do the same thing here with... Um, Jackie, a little bit more on her left. Between. Yes, yeah. So what you just saw there was um, the actors were acting uh, a part of the show and you were hearing the stage manager calling cues uh, and the operator was responding by saying standing by and then they were activating the cues. The actors could not hear the stage manager calling those cues. The, the audio is isolated from one another. 
And then you heard the director say, can we hold? And, and the message came up on screen that said, hold, please. That tells the actors to stop. And it also allows the actors and the, and the stage manager and the technical people to all talk to one another again. So now we're in a, now we're in a hold. Everyone can talk to each other. We can make adjustments. We can fix anything we need to, and then we can continue. Here's another little clip uh, where you can actually see the uh, broadcast software in action. Great work, guys. Okay, everybody start to continue? Yep. Okay. Um, Kylie, can you go from, you could not dishonor my bed and live a delightful life mocking me? You could not dishonor my bed and live a delightful life. Stand by Merge, H3. The princess and Cleon, your marriage broker, and will not have impunity to throw me out of here. That's the way it is. Go on, call me a Merge, H3. And the trusting Scylla. I attacked your heart as you. Go. You hurt yourself and share in the suffering. True. So uh, what you just saw there was, you know, we were in a hold. Um, the stage manager asked if, if we were good, if we could continue. And then the stage manager delivered instructions to the actors, telling them where to resume the, sh the acting from. And then that hold, please, um, that hold, please, disappeared from the screen, telling the actors, okay, you can continue, and the stage manager continued calling cues. So that's how that process goes during uh, the cue to cue rehearsal uh, as part of technical rehearsal. We go through things, we basically one change at a time, stopping and starting, stopping and starting. So we were using that on-screen message as a way to you know, more clearly communicate to everyone. Normally, if we were in a theater together, um, the stage manager would just, you know, use a microphone with a really, you know, loud speakers, and everyone would hear the stage manager say "hold." And but, you know, to help help with that, we we put a message on screen. Uh, these are just some of the the things we did to prepare for emergencies during a live show about how we would respond to issues if they were to occur. You know, if an actor was to drop out of the meeting, how would we react to that? Um, you know, we, we had a procedure in place for the storyteller in My Father's Dragon to take over and read the lines of another actor's part if they were to drop out of the show due to an internet problem. Um, and if we really had to, the stage manager also could have taken over um, and read lines from the script out loud so that the show could proceed if we ran into a major problem. Um, so our, our live show, uh, one of the, th the, the challenges with the live show is um, you want to have your live stream up and running so the audience can kind of tune in before the show starts and, you know, you, you, you make sure that, you, you know, your, your live video is working properly. But while that is playing, you also need to be able to converse. All the actors need to be able to converse with one another while um, the audience can't hear them. So it, we, we had to do some interesting things to sort of create ourselves a space where we could all talk to each other before the live show began, but we could actually be sending video and audio out to the audience. This brings us to the performance phase of our project. And um, going into performance, one of the last things we want to do is to do some pre-show checks uh, with the actors before the uh, before each performance starts. It's sort of the, the, the final thing that we do to make sure all the technical elements are ready to do that run of the, uh, the performance. So I'm going to play you a little video uh, clip here of some of our pre-show checks. Good. Thank you. So you're seeing in the top right corner that we're checking um, audio and lighting and the framing of Jillian of our actors before the show starts. And we have a that uh, kind of red overlay on screen to help them get their cameras lined up in case their cameras have moved since the last time we did framing a show looks pretty or, good. or a rehearsal. The watch is lovely and I have such a craving for something sweet. You know, also, we're testing Awake. out, testing out <laughs> their uh, their green screen, making sure that right. the lighting hasn't changed um, since the last rehearsal. 
Yeah, I don't. I think doing an audio check. Also looking at all the actors on screen together to make sure that the color matching is good. We don't need to make any brightness or contrast adjustments. So the next video clip I'm going to show you is kind of the final uh, uh, phase uh, as we're about to start the show. So it's it's all the actors hanging out um, in in uh, you know this kind of green room space before the show starts, and then we lead into the start of the show. Uh, call uh, back us standby A two. A two standing. Have a good show, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep that energy high. We the best we music. The so we're in like the last, you know. Yeah, yeah. Right, Dan? Toothless says break a leg. Literally. Like the last minute before we, we uh, are about Just to think of Michael stepping start the show. Spaghetti, singing, I want to go where you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's what get, motivates me to get through the show. And keep chugging. DJ you know? Khaled. All right. Another one. Tell me when. Yep. A2. Go. So we've activated a, the next queue now. We're in our final countdown for the start of the show, which you see in the top right corner. And our first queue of the show is in the top left corner with our actress waiting. Uh, essentially, she's waiting in the wings now. So in this last... Uh, three minutes here, you know, all the actors are essentially waiting in the wings. They're like sitting, it's like they're standing right there off the side of the stage. They're not talking to anybody else. They're just in the zone waiting to appear on screen for the first time in the show. Uh, which brings us to our actual performance. So again, if you haven't watched it yet, the links are available here. Um, I'm going to show you a few um, behind the scenes uh, clips um, just in case you haven't had a chance to go see it. First, I'm going to show you the teaser from My Father's Dragon. So that was just the, the teaser that we put out kind of highlighting some of the moments in the show. Um, the next clip I'm going to show you is what things look like on the studio side of the system. So um, you're going to see all our computers set up and the first computer you're going to see here is our live captioning that's going on. So that's the live captioning. There's a backup computer there. And then you're seeing all the individual laptops receiving the video from the actors. In this case they're performing as the monkeys in the show. And then you're going to see the live stream there. And then this is the mixing computer receiving all the video, compositing the scene together and sending it out of the studio. Here's another little look at the computers as the actors are uh, performing on their green screens. This is the moment where they all throw tangerines at Elmer. So you'll see um, the individual actors throw their tangerines and Elmer just got hit by a bunch of tangerines because there's somebody in his room that's helping him out throwing tangerines at, at him uh, so it looks like the, uh, the actors are more directly interacting with one another. Cool. And the last clip I'm going to show you from the um, uh, running of My Father's Dragon is actually a behind the scenes look at the stage manager calling cues for the most complicated part of the show, which was the, the musical number, uh, the Wahoo song. Never could sing a high class thing. The music he never knew, but I can Wahoo. X5. Wahoo. Go. Oh, I never could dance X6. when I dance. Go. My legs are like bamboo, but I can X7. wahoo, wahoo, wahoo. Go. It's just a game of the jungle. You shouted when adventure starts. It's very good for X8. anxious hearts. Take it away, shrubs. Go. <laughs> 
X9. Go. So uh, you could hear the stage manager calling each of the cues during that musical number, and it, it worked quite well. They were able to, you know, um, you know, call cues, and the operator was able to trigger them, you know, very consistently for something that was so fast-paced. And you actually didn't hear the operator saying "standing by" in that case because the cues were just, uh, you know, they were just coming too quickly. So. Um, the, the operator doesn't really have time to say standing by between every queue. So they were just doing, just activating each queue as the stage manager called them because they were so fast. Uh, this is again a little look at the live captioning and our post production editing uh, for the final release of My Father's Dragon Medea. So that was, uh, of course, not live. So we were really performing it mainly to be recorded. Though we did rehearse the show and program it like we were going to perform it live. We were probably 85%, I would say, to being able to perform Medea live. Um, but as we did our final recording, we sort of transitioned to more of a TV or film-like schedule where we were only, you know, okay, we're only going to record these scenes or these parts on this night, and then we're going to, you know, record these scenes or these parts on a different night. So uh, I'll show you, again, if you want to see the finished product, you can click on these links. And I'm just going to show you while you're here, I'll scrub through a little bit of the final video so you can kind of see how it turned out. Jason himself in every way. And may I gaze upon him and his bride gouged out. Cloak my words. Afraid you may incurably harm my daughter. Come now, Medea. If you had lived on the mountainous edge of the earth, arrows from your golden bow, anointed with desire, may moderation, the finest gift of the gods, grace me. May terrible Aphrodite never cast into me angry quarrels and endless strife, striking my heart for another bed. Respecting peaceful unions, may she judge marriage for a woman wisely. Leave you up to anyone, but you shall depart from this land on your own feet. I wish to be blameless to my allies. Come, as you asked. Destruction upon your children's lives, and your wife, a horrible death. Unhappy man. How wisdom, the muses speak with a few of us. Not all. Maybe one among many. Yet, muses do inspire. Worthwhile for the sake of the children. She saw the white foam frothing from her mouth. Conquered by disaster, only a parent could recognize her. And is lost in vain, leaving the most inhospitable strait of the dark clashing rocks. I brought you from your barbarian home into a Greek household. Sanctuary of Era Akraya, where no enemy can abuse them, digging up their rooms. There's just a little look at uh, how the show turned out. Um, a couple other things. Um, just to make you aware of if you're interested in learning more about our show. We did do a talk back with a couple special guests that is also available on YouTube. Our production also was submitted for review by the KCACTF Region 1 um, and some of our actors were nominated to participate in the Irene Ryan Scholarship auditions. Uh, and our stage manager was also nominated for stage management. So they were essentially uh, invited to participate in the Region 1 Festival. And our director also presented a faculty convivium talk um, about our production of Medea, which is also available online at this link. The last part of the performance process was our photo calls, um, which included cast and crew photos. So a photo call is a, a special rehearsal where you essentially pause the actors in their action, have them hold still so that you can take um, still photos of them without having you know, motion blur and, and other issues you know, caused by them moving around the stage. Um, and we found it was still very useful to do that even in our remote performance context. Um, because it, you know, we could get the actors to, you know, to pose and then, you know, take a screenshot 
uh, of, of the screen. Um, and you get better results from that than uh, trying to pause a video after the fact and, and grab screenshots from it. And it's also a fun process for the actors, you know, to kind of end the show this way, um, since you don't have sort of your traditional ending, you know, to the, the performance process where we sort of strike and, and take everything apart. You know, we don't really have much of that to do. So, um, you know, we set up some fun uh, layouts for the actors to take cast photos and take fun photos with one another. You know, for My Father's Dragon, we let everyone, you know, take a picture with the dragon from the storybook, you know. Some of our actors wanted to get photos together, so we put them together on screen, um, like Kylie and Deanna here, so they could get a screenshot together. So it's just a nice kind of fun thing to do to get capture, you know, pictures of the show, you know, for posterity, um, you know, and, and also for all, you know, all the actors to remember the experience. So um, the final phase of this is to you know, reflect a little bit on everything that we have done here you know, for our shows and developing and using our remote performance system, starting with, of course, the goals that we set out to achieve. Um, and we certainly uh, I achieved all the goals that we set out to, I think, and then some, you know, everything we wanted to do, we were able to achieve with the system that we put together um, with all the support that, that we received um, from, from the college. Um, I'm going to skip across some of these other uh, these other things. These are reflections on you know some of the the particulars of the system we put together and how we used it. You know particulars about how we used Zoom and how it how it performed for us. Um, you know particulars about you know the whole process of working with actors at home is it's very very demanding. It's it's demanding on us. It's demanding on the actors. You know a lot of work goes into it, and you really you really need to train you know, plan out the process of training and providing things for the actors. So, you know, they know what to expect, um, you know, in terms of what they're going to have to do. And you know, you know what to expect um, as far as the training you're going to have to provide. So, and, um, you know, it's definitely was important for us to supply actors with as much as we could, you know, uh, afford to provide them to make sure they have what they need and they're all on, you know, kind of an even playing field and they can all participate. Um, you know, by the time we were said and done, more than half of our actors had loaner computers from the college um, to enable them to perform, you know, remotely from home. Um, some other reflections about particulars uh, of the process. You know, it was very, very valuable to do those pre-tech consult meetings we did with the actors. Um, though that was really helped us be successful in our technical rehearsal process because we had already had a video meeting with each actor to make sure their setups at home were going to work well for them. The, some things about the microphones and the lights that we used, uh, reflections about the design process. Um, you know, a big one with this is is what I mentioned before about considering the labor needs um, of of the project and how traditional theater designers fit into um, the show in a remote format. You know, um, whether whether our, your you know designers are really up for transitioning to this format or not, whether they feel they have the expertise that they need or not to you know to transfer into this mostly digital environment um, was certainly a challenge um, if if we could go back and storyboard both of our projects you know a lot earlier in the process I think that would have been would, would be a great thing to do it was very hard for us to do because we were developing our remote performance system at the same time as we were trying to sort of creative creatively plan the shows so it's very hard to decide you know what you can what you want to do creatively when you're not even 100 percent sure yet what the system is capable of so um, there's definitely a lot of challenges in uh, implementing design uh, with the with the system use of green screen you know challenging but certainly added to the the audience and actor experience a lot um, there's a there's a lot of difficulty that goes into you know getting a green screen set up correctly and lit properly so it, it works right and you don't end up with costumes and things that are transparent and whatnot um, but it overall it was i think it was definitely worth it um, and again you know it the earlier that we could have planned out our our you know, we could have storyboarded our shows to, to figure out 
um, how we were going to do our layouts and things, I think that would have that would have just helped the process go a little bit smoother. Um, you know, but overall, it was very successful. Presenting items to the camera, yeah, you know, we had some difficulties. How we were originally going to do our dragon. Originally, um, the idea was to have the actors hold up individual physical panels to their cameras in order to compose the dragon on screen. Um, and we just had a lot of difficulty with the actors, you know, getting that lined up and then having issues with lighting reflections. And it's it's quite challenging to get actors, you know, to do fine tuning of their lighting at home. It's just it's it's just really difficult. Um, it can be done. It's just time consuming. So we did end up taking uh, our designer, John Bagby's uh, a photo of his of his uh, dragon panels and bringing that into the. Uh, to the software as a graphic. So we were able to still retain the design, just use it in a different way than we were planning on. Singing and playing of instruments, I think, w was very successful. Acapella work actually um, worked quite well. Um, and even the delays we had from the system, I thought um, w they, w they work kind of like row, row, row your boat, you know, like a, a musical round. Like it doesn't, it wasn't necessarily intentional, but it, you know, it, it sounded pretty good, um, depending on what you, you know, what you consider to be sufficiently musical or not. But we did have a lot, we did have troubles with, you know, uh, sounds coming through, you know, uh, when a lot of things are going on, all of the different instruments and sounds, you know, would not come through Zoom very well. Technical rehearsal process, some specific reflections about how that went. I mean, overall, it was, it was quite quite successful our whole procedure for the the holding and everything worked very well recording versus performing live you know recording um live certainly feels more like a traditional theater performance but it's certain it's much more complicated and stressful still can be very fulfilling when you do you know work it out and, and get it to work successfully um but you know planning for technical issues is is certainly a challenge um you know uh, there's a lot to think about and you know if you're going to record even are you going to try to record your show all in one take or are you going to you know sort of record it piecemeal and then do a lot of editing after the fact um so um you know overall it was it was an interesting process to do one show recorded and one show live definitely a good thing that we did our uh, Medea first, which was recorded, and then the second show, My Father's Dragon, was live. So recording is sort of lower stakes. We could kind of fine tune things and, you know, learn things as we went that we could then apply to our live performance with My Father's Dragon later. So um, start with recorded show and then do a live show. <laughs> Um, all of our procedures for dealing with performance emergencies work, you know, really worked well, though we didn't even encounter any major connection problems or, or bandwidth problems, you know, very minor momentary audio dips, video glitches and things, but nothing really serious. You know, Zoom stopped recognizing someone's microphone during a show and we lost some lines, but, you know, they were able to correct and keep going. So there was nothing, no, no major show stoppages. Uh, stoppages during any of our live shows, which was which is really fortunate. So, um, you know, these are some reflections on repetitive performance because we did do six live performances of My Father's Dragon. Um, you know, and there are particular considerations and things that come up once you start performing a show over and over again. Um, you know, extreme examples, of course, are like Broadway shows that are you know going to run for weeks and weeks and weeks or months or even years and there's a, all sorts of things you have to think about in terms of maintaining a show when you're performing it many many times um and one thing you know i i would say is you know in this whole process trying to keep it as as fun and light-hearted as possible is a good thing i think um you know, it's possible to take a pretty dark view of of having to do remote performance, you know, at all to begin with, and anything that can kind of compensate for that, you know, um, you know, like in this case, you know, just having some fun with our our pre-show, you know, setup uh, with my father's dragon, just just things to try to keep it, you know, a positive experience for everybody, you know, is a is a good thing. The acting experience is, you know. 
far from ideal in this format. You know, actors are really saturated by the pressures of wearing many different hats, all the things they have to do. Um, you know, they may or may not really work well with seeing themselves on screen. You know, it's like watching yourself while you're trying to perform. Um, you know, and there are issues of, you know, whenever you try to incorporate anything new into a show in particular that starts taking a lot of time, you know, it kind of, it starts to feel like it's taking over, you know, the direct, the directing and the acting uh, in a way. And, you know, the combination of this being new and having a lot of limitations built in certainly, you know, created some of that. Um, you know, and there's a lot of challenges with actors at home trying to direct their action away from the camera or the video monitor. You know, you have this weather person type effect, you know, normally a weather person on the news, you know, they're using a green screen to show you, you know, a weather map and they have a monitor off to the side of them separate from the camera that they can look at. None of our actors had a monitor uh, like that. Um, so, and, you know, it's arguable whether a monitor would really help because they need to direct their attention um, in so many, you know, potentially different directions depending on, you know, where other actors are on screen. So that's that's quite a challenge in this uh, format. And uh, last thing here is, of course, the remote cue calling and, and controlling things remotely. And overall, that worked really, really well. You know, the audio transmission and mouse clicks, we never had any problem with. You know, we had some video lag problems, but not enough to, you know, to cause any major issues. Facebook Messenger worked great. And, you know, our stage management teams and our, our uh, worked, worked really, really well. So uh, Belle and Rebecca here on My Father's Dragon and Katie and Riley on uh, Medea, they all did uh, an awesome job uh, calling cues and running the show even though they weren't actually, you know, with us in our studio. So awesome job to our stage managers and operators. Final thoughts. So uh, we always say this in theater, you know, we, we always want more time than we have available to do whatever it is we're doing. So if possible to anyone out there who's trying to do this, I give yourself more time if you can. You know, especially if it's your first go at it, I wish we had more time. You know, the weeks went by really, really fast. You know, there's things that it's like, uh, we wanted to accomplish that in week two. And next thing you know, it's week five and we still haven't actually done anything on, on whatever it was. So, um, you know, also this, this whole thing is, you know, is it's an unchosen pursuit. We didn't choose to have to do theater performance this way. Um, and it's certainly not something we would have chosen. Um, but I think, I think it still is one with value. It, it, you know, it's helping, I think it's helping us get through this, but it's also expanding the, the landscape of what's possible for future theater projects. And I think, I think, um, I, I hope that some types of remote performance will persist, you know, after, uh, you know, we're past, uh, this time, um, you know, it'll be more maybe acceptable or, or, um, something that people think to do to actually have actors from very different places come together and, and do a show together in a remote format, um, or even to integrate, you know, remote aspects into a live show, you know, I think would be less afraid of, or, or concerned about the idea of, you know, say putting a projection screen on stage during a live show and then bringing a remote actor you know, from somewhere else into the show that way. Um, I, I think it would be interesting to, to do things like that. And having the experience with this technology certainly makes it um, more feasible for us to implement that ourselves. But, um, and, you know, last thing, you know, overall, I'm just thankful for the theater that we can make, you know, which is of course enabled by the technology that we have our, at our fingertips. I think, I think, you know, overall, I'm thankful for, for the technology that we have available to help us stay in, uh, in touch with one another and still be able to produce theater in some way. Um, and I think, you know, we should, you know, we should continue to share our successes and our failures that, that uh, we're all having in this format. Um, of remote performance, you know, to help another one, you know, help one another with it and, and through it. Um, and my, my email address is here. I can be reached, um, you know, 
if uh, if anyone is is trying to do this and has questions about anything that they've seen in this presentation. So um, I think it's all about trying to continue moving forward, and we can we can do that by helping one another. Let's wrap this up with some quick credits. This is uh, the cast of our production of Medea, our production team. Special thanks for Medea. Uh, this is our cast for My Father's Dragon, uh, the production team for My Father's Dragon, and some special thanks. Uh, some special thanks to uh, people who helped us out with this whole re remote performance system. Steve Maniscalco, our Chief Information Officer. Leslie Bidwell, Director of IT, Networking and Telecom. Mark English, our Technology Services Manager, provided us with computers and other equipment we needed. Uh, Damon Madison, Network Support Specialist, helped us with our network switch and upgrading our bandwidth capability of our, our, mass, our main computer. Dave Giese, Creative Media Services Director, Director of our TV studio. He provided a lot of broadcast video expertise throughout the process and, and helped us in many, many ways. Lisa Miller, Director of Marketing, Jared Stanley, Digital Media Producer, uh, assisted us with uh, publishing our productions on YouTube. Uh, Logan Hazard, ITS Customer Support, uh, was, was very involved in providing loaner laptops for students um, at home. Uh, Anthony Beltucci, Computer Lab Systems Administrator, uh, helped us upgrade our uh, bandwidth capabilities of our mixing computer so that we could send all the data we needed to. And then last but not least, Scott Seeger, our Theater Department Technical Director, uh, who did all the purchasing for uh, all the equipment we needed for the system and the shows, helped out with the testing process, and he managed all of the uh, provisioning and shipping of, uh, of the equipment to actors at home, which is quite a project in itself. And of course, he also acted in Medea as one of the shadow characters uh, in the uh, during the messenger monologue in scene seven. So thank you, Scott, and thank you to everyone um, I just named for uh, helping us with this remote performance project. If there's any further um, questions you have, my contact information is here. More information about our theater department is down in the bottom right here. Documents can be downloaded here. Some other discussion forums uh, applicable to this type of work um, are down in the bottom left here. A couple of Facebook groups. Uh, USITT Technical Production Solutions Forum is a Google group. Uh, controlbooth.com. There's a couple other organizations that I've noticed in tech theater educators that are using vMix in a similar manner to uh, what uh, the way that we were. Um, they're both their Facebook pages are both listed here. Um, you can you can search for uh, Josh and tech theater educators here um, about the Olathe West High School Theater. Um, he's the one who posted about their projects um, in in the uh, tech theater educators group. So. Uh, with that, um, reach out if you have any uh, information or feedback to provide, and uh, best of luck with your shows.